personal personal finance. Uh, so we'll start with, let's see here, just a few guidelines and then we'll get, I'll give a little more introduction on my background. Uh, the first is that uh, I am not a financial advisor in the sense that you know, I am unable to provide you very specific uh, investment guidance or financial guidance for your particular situation. It's important that after we finish our discussion, you use some of the things that I talk about today to further your understanding and sit down with an advisor who can look at your very specific situation in order to offer some uh, additional guidance on an approach that you might take to ensure that you have a strong uh, financial future uh, following your Columbia experience. The next thing I'll say is this is truly an introduction. Some items may be known to many of you and other things may be very new. And just like any other muscle that you have to work, whether it's your brain or your tricep in order to make it stronger and better, even if there are things you've seen before, heard before, it never hurts to reinforce those concepts and that dialogue. So hopefully we can engage in that later on. And please also use the chat feature and the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom presentation. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. We'll be tracking those to come to a little bit later in the discussion. Uh, if there's something you, I do that you really like, please feel free to uh, say that in the chat as well. And if you have any recommendations, uh, please include those or any other resources that you might know. Uh, just like I said before, I can't answer the question of what is a good investment when we get to the section about uh, investing. You have to sit down with a, a licensed advisor who can give you some very personalized uh, guidance. I will not have enough time to cover, uh, cover everything, so I don't mean to go fast. It's meant to be an overview so that we can get to some of the Q&A. Uh, definitely won't be addressing cryptocurrency, cannabis, penny stocks, or other more speculative uh, assets when it comes to, comes to investing, although I will talk about stocks in general near the end. And most importantly, let's have some fun in this discussion about money. My own personal experiences, I have become uh, well-versed, but also just really curious and in increasing my understanding of how money works and, and how, it, uh, how capital is critical in our personal and our professional lives. So again, Ken gave a bit of my uh, background. I'm born and raised here in Chicago, but I did attend Tulane, New Orleans, graduated Columbia Business School, worked at Procter & Gamble in between was my first job. Um, I'll, I'll tell a funny story about some of my own financial experience when I joined Procter & Gamble uh, in 2000 uh, as well and my inability to, to manage capital the way I, I wish I did when I graduated from undergrad. Uh, when I moved to New York to attend business school, I actually worked as an entrepreneur in the music, music business, uh, more money stories there, which we may not be able to get to all of them that impacted my credit and, and debt and, and savings or lack thereof, because I was putting everything into being an entrepreneur. And that ultimately led me back to Chicago, where I ended up working at my mentor's private equity firm, Muller and Monroe Asset Management. I'll talk a little bit about private equity, actually a little bit in this presentation uh, as well. And then as Ken pointed out, as an I was inspired to start this organization, One Stock, One Future, to turn 1 million youth into public company shareholders. So I teach basic classes about stocks to kids ages eight to 18. I donate shares to each student in the program through the money that I've raised through One Stock, One Future. And then that stock ownership becomes a jumping off point for many of the topics, or pretty much all the topics that we're discussing today because we can tie that stock ownership back to any aspect of money. And the inspiration for that was my niece cadence uh, shown here. She's 12 years old now, but when she was eight years old, I started her off with a portfolio of Nike, Apple, and Disney. And through that conversation and dialogue about her newfound stock ownership, I was amazed at her curiosity. And I said, well, if I can get this eight-year-old child to be asking these types of questions about her newfound ownership, I wonder what would happen if I did that with 100 other kids, 10,000 other kids. And I said, why not? Let's dream big and try to turn 1 million youth and the public company shareholders. So, so now her portfolio, uh, as you can see on the screen here, is made up of some of the top, com top companies or at least brands in the world. Uh, I'm not necessarily speaking about whether or not they're a good stock, but just they're brands that we all know and recognize. And that's the power of One Stock, One Future. Uh, in addition to these, she also owns uh, Uber, Tesla, uh, and Dunkin' Donuts. So happy to report, excuse me, her last quarter. She did really well. Uh, with her with her portfolio and this is all a part of building her own wealth story and preparing her for her financial future now let's move on so what will we discuss in the next uh you know 30 minutes or so 25 30 minutes or so these are the keys to your personal financial management now that you've graduated i think these are the key areas that you need to consider con 
consider all the time as you're managing your money. Uh, you have to budget, you need to save, manage your credit, make sure you pay down debt, and of course, we'll talk about investing a bit. So on the budget side, uh, what is budgeting? Uh, in short, it just means every dollar that you earn in income has a job. And so one of the things I want you to write down is an income statement. You've heard that term when it as it relates to companies managing revenue and expenses, but the same thing applies in your personal life. Uh, so in short, only two things happen with money. They either come into your possession or they leave your possession. Money, that, money comes in the door, money goes out the door. You, earn, you're going, you guys are going to earn money from your jobs or starting businesses, and you need to make sure that every dollar that comes into your possession has a job. Now, what is that job? That job is to either be saved, which is an interesting way to think about an expense, by the way. So don't want to confuse anyone early, but I often try to profess that think of savings as just another one of your expenses. It's one that you cannot miss. You should think of savings as an expense, no different than paying for your cell phone or paying your light bill, paying your cable bill or paying your car note. Savings has to be part of your equation. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. But when it comes to the money coming into the door and going out of the door, you're either sending that dollar to work to either wait for you until you need it, you're sending that dollar out to bring you back some product or some service that you may want or need, or you're sending that dollar out to go make a few friends and then bring those friends back to you. And we'll discuss that part of investing. Because we have a short time today, I won't walk through some of the, all of the tactics and principles around uh, budgeting. There are lots of, there's various apps from mint.com and others that will help you uh, budget. There's no perfect way to budget, which is why I'm focusing this presentation on really getting into the mindset of its importance. If you're unable to account for every dollar that you earned and then where it went in terms of paying for housing, uh, uh, utilities, cell phone, car note, bills, um, and savings, then that creates a challenge for accomplishing everything else on that circle that we just discussed. So I think it's critical in this, in this next stage of your life, whether you're graduating undergrad or graduate school, and whether you've had a job or not, is to really focus on this area of budgeting and accounting for every dollar that comes into your possession. So next, let's talk about saving and, and why that's so critical. So we save because we want to put monies away to use, usually to uh, prepare for perhaps larger purchases, which would include uh, taking care of your education. Which, again, you guys have all graduated, so your education was taken care of in lots of different ways, from scholarships to loans, and perhaps in many cases, your own savings or your family savings. We save to buy a home, which often comes with a larger upfront um, purchase, um, sorry, a larger upfront down payment that you need to purchase that home. So we save to make those types of purchases. It's also important that you save for emergencies. That's that third section that you see on the slide because stuff happens. Stuff happens and you want to be prepared so that when stuff happens that you have monies available to cover those things. It could be uh, an injury, unfortunately. It could be a loss of a job. So if, you, if, you're, if you've been working, you're earning income, and for whatever reason, whether due to the economy or other issues, you lose that job and that income goes away, you still have those bills that we, from the other slide, those expenses that still need to, need to get covered. And so it's important that you have that savings pool of cash to make sure you can cover those expenses. Rule of thumb is to have six to nine months worth of expenses saved away. So on the budgeting slide, part of what you do in that process is identify everything that you purchase each month. And you break that down into things that, you, that, that remain the same in its price. Things like rent and mortgage tend not to change. Your car note tends not to change. Your cell phone bill payment, generally speaking, tends not to change. Other items, eating out, um, partying, uh, or even groceries, those what we call variable expenses because they don't stay the same every month. They fluctuate based on your utilization but you still should have an idea of what you're spending. If you look at all those expenses over, over time and you multiply that by six, multiply it by nine, that, is, should be, that should be the goal of how much you need to have saved because that way, if you do run out of in regular income, you know that those savings will be there to help you out through those challenges. So now let's talk about uh, credit. 
And so credit is another form of debt. It is a bank or an institution essentially giving you the flexibility of borrowing money from them. With a traditional loan, like with school loans or mortgages, which we'll talk about in a second, it's an institution says, I'm gonna loan you X amount of money and you're gonna pay me back at Y percent interest. I loan you $10,000, you pay me back at 5% interest. So it means every year, every month, your payment includes a little bit of extra money to ensure that I not only get my $10,000 back, but that I make a little bit more to compensate me for giving you that money and for me not having it uh, for that period of time. A credit card, on the other hand, is the opportunity or the option to borrow money. And so a credit card has something called a limit. Limit is the maximum amount that you can charge on that card. So if you have a car with a $10,000 limit, you can go out and buy up to $10,000 worth of goods or services. I strongly recommend against ever spending that much on a credit card that has that limit, and I'll explain why uh, in a second. But that's the general premise of a credit card. We often get the first one in college. For, many, for any of the listeners who just graduated undergrad, uh, my guess is at some point in time uh, during your time at school, if you go back a million years ago when I was starting undergrad in 1996, we still had these things called books with paper and words in them that we used to learn. And when we would buy, go buy those books at the bookstore, we'd open them up and there'd be flyers and leaflets for all types of credit cards. And what happens is to apply for that credit card, you needed to provide two things, your name and your address. And next thing you know, they were telling an 18, 17, 18 year old kid who had never had a credit card, you can go out and buy $2,000 worth of stuff and not have to pay for it right now. That was a dream come true to an 18 year old. And I saw many classmates go through that uh, as well while they were at Tulane. And even I myself had my own challenges in trying to manage money at that point that I had to come back and fix uh, later on. So now let's talk about why credit is so important. It's important because it's an indication of your trustworthiness related to money. It's an indication of your trustworthiness. Is this someone that pays back their debt? And so when I look at your credit score or when a bank or any other institution looks at your credit score, it's kind of like the ACT or the SAT to get into college. It doesn't tell you everything, but it gives you a general indication of where that individual um, sits on the scale of that trustworthiness related to money. And on the next slide, I'll talk about the component of that score just to give you a better sense. And that'll be a critical slide to take away from today's presentation, excuse me, as well. Um, credit scores affect many areas of, they affect many areas of your life, including loans for essentially any large purchase, purchase that you'd like to make from a home to a car to starting a business. Each of those opportunities to borrow money in order to make that purchase, someone is going to want to know what's your credit score. And that begins to determine uh, not only whether or not you have an opportunity to get that loan, but the terms by which you have to pay that money back. If you have a worse credit score and I'm loaning you money to do something, then I'm going to say, hmm, Jeff or Sarah or Mike or Jennifer, I'm going to say that credit score is a bit lower, which means there's some risk there around how that person manages money. I'm still willing to loan it to you but I'm gonna need you to pay me back a little bit more in interest than I might to someone who has a higher credit score because I have greater confidence in their ability uh, and their willingness to pay, their, their, their ability to pay me back on a regular basis. So that's the importance of credit. And it not only can it potentially deny you opportunities if you have a lower credit score, but it will cost you more money to actually have a low credit score. Uh, third, credit can also affect employment opportunities. Now, every company, doesn't run credit checks, but as you can imagine, working in the financial services world, um, you know, our firm, uh, Muller and Monroe, a private equity firm, we manage $1.2 billion on behalf of institutional investors. And so for anyone at the organization on the investment team, or especially in the back office as well, the accounting folks, they have to have a, a clear, strong sense of understanding and money management in their own lives because they're now being asked to manage capital on behalf of hundreds of thousands or millions of other beneficiaries. And so in, in lots of industries, having a low credit score can actually affect 
your uh, employment opportunities. I see a couple of questions about robo-advisors and retirement, and that will uh, come up uh, just a little bit later as soon as we get to the investment section. So thank you. Please keep the questions coming uh, in the chat. And if I don't answer them during the presentation, um, uh, Jenna and Ken will ensure that they, with the, time, with the time we have remaining, that we have an opportunity to address those a bit later. So uh, there are five crucial factors related to the impact or that can impact your credit score. So let's walk through those uh, quickly. So just like recall in school, there's weightings for exams and quizzes and homework and class participation as it relates to the grade you receive in that class. Same thing with credit scores. Now, I wish I could tell you that there was some truly scientific, well-known method for how the scores are calculated. Unfortunately, they are not. Somebody created a box. This information goes in a box, out pops a number, and unfortunately, you tend to get stuck with that number. Now, I'm gonna walk you through just a few of the key areas that you need to monitor and manage in order to give yourself the best chance of getting the highest score possible. But what I mean by it's not a formula is I, I can't tell you if you pay off X amount of your credit card, your score will go up by this much. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because there are so many variables that this computer is crunching in order to assess your score. But now with that said, let's talk about the five key areas as you see on the left of the screen. The, and I'm gonna focus on the two most significant factors. So for anyone listening who either currently carries credit, credit cards, thinking about getting more credit and credit cards as you move into your professional lives post-graduation, these two areas account for 65% of your credit score. And it's the two areas where I really want you guys to make sure that you don't let these two slip. Not that the others are unimportant, but these two areas are so, criti so critical that anything that goes awry in these two areas can cause tremendous dip in your score. The first is payment history. Simply put, pay on time. And, that, and you see that accounts for more than a third of your credit score. So if you currently have a credit card, here's a piece of advice for you right now. Put that credit card on automatic payment for at least the minimum. Put your credit cards on automatic payment for at least the minimum. Because what that does is it protects you and ensures that even if you forget that if you're on vacation somewhere and, 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 and you just, for whatever reason, forget to make that manual payment on that credit card, that it still gets paid. Whether that minimum is $20 or $50, whatever it is, at least you know the minimum is paid and it's paid on time. Therefore, the credit company will not, credit card company will not report that you missed a payment. The second are the, is the amount owed, accounting for just a little less than a third uh, of your credit score. So when it comes to a, amount owed, there's a ratio that I want you guys to, to remember. There's a balance that you can carry on a credit card. That is, how much have you used of that credit card to buy goods and services? And then there's the limit, which I mentioned earlier, which is the maximum amount that you can spend or purchase on a credit card. So if you have a limit of $10,000, and you bought $2,000 worth of goods and services, then your amount owed is 20%. That's your, your ratio. And so the goal is to keep that ratio definitely less than 30%, but ideally around that 20% or less mark. And that's just one of those oddities of the credit world where it's like you have this $10,000 limit, but in order to be seen as having good credit, you need to only use 20% of it. Now, does that mean you can never buy something for $8,000 on your $10,000 credit card? It does not. But if you do that, just be sure that before the end of the month, you've paid that $8,000 back down to keep it under uh, 20%. And once you, get, again, work that muscle and the, uh, the appropriate habits and practices for managing credit, then you can use it to make those kinds of purchases, pay it down, and get the benefits and rewards that come with uh, managing a credit card. The other three areas, again, length of credit card history, um, of whether or not you've applied for any new credit and having a mix of credit and lending type platforms from uh, mortgages to auto loan to credit cards, those all impact your credit score as well. On the right side, you see a breakdown of a range of scores and what's considered exceptional, very good, all the way down to poor. And so I encourage you to visit annualcreditreport.com Every year, you're entitled to one free credit report. Take a look at that report, see what your score is, see where you rank on the scale, and begin to take the 
um, initiatives to address that credit, that credit fit. And so while each specific situation is different, those two items, payment history and amounts owed, are two of the most critical. Of course, if you slip in those areas and don't pay something for a long period of time, it becomes a bad, it becomes a, um, a default on your credit report. And those have tremendous negative consequences for your scores. So definitely be mindful that you're paying on time. And there are ways to address even if you have emergencies where you can't pay. I just encourage you to speak to your banker, speak to your lender, speak to your credit card company. Try not to disappear on them because you want to hide. So now we're on to the debt piece. Just talk briefly about good debt and bad debt. Um, good debt is a term you may have heard. It's about buying assets that appreciate in value, like this education you just received from Columbia. One would call that a good debt. I would definitely call it good debt uh, in my case, even though I'm not quite done paying off those school loans. I'm getting close now after all this time. Um, buying a home because the expectation is that it is going to appreciate in value, that it should improve your net worth. That is debt that's often worth using. You don't have to always take out a lot of it, but it's not, generally speaking, not considered bad debt. Bad debt is debt used to purchase something that depreciates, meaning it does not provide at least any financial value. So uh, clothes, cars, vacations, do you want all three of those things? Absolutely. But my recommendation is just be mindful on the amount and levels of debt that you take on to secure those items. So if you need to take a vacation, as opposed to borrowing $5,000 to take a really nice vacation or whatever the amount is, perhaps save up that money over time and then use that cash to take the vacation. Therefore, you're not taking on debt, which then will end up costing you even more money on the other side of that. So if, you, if you're going to take on debt, use it to buy, use it to buy assets. Now let's talk about the investing side. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I work in private equity right now, started this One Stock, One Future organization. Uh, investing covers a wide variety of opportunities in order to purchase assets and securities that hopefully will appreciate in value for you. And when we're starting out our lives and our careers, uh, we're often not um, educated uh, about this topic. We're often not told what are our options in order to begin investing. Uh, there were also years ago, there tended to be more limitations on getting started investing because of the presumption that you already had a certain amount of capital to start investing. So many of the firms through which you would use to invest monies required a minimum, let's say $2,500. And I didn't have that money when I was coming out of school. I was barely had enough money to pay rent, buy food, and pay my car note. So I didn't feel like I had $2,500 to go get an account started. And I'll talk briefly about why that's no longer the case and why for as little as $50, $25, $5, you can get started investing in some of the same things that you saw my niece investing in early on. So I'm going to focus on uh, stocks and I'm going to work my way up to mutual funds, why they're important and how you can get them uh, in your portfolio. So very simply, stock is just ownership in a company indicated by shares that entitles you to an opportunity to grow as the company grows and make money as the company makes money. Uh, my, my, my granny, who's 80 years old, makes an amazing sweet potato pie. And so if you think of this pie as the company, then owning stock is like getting a slice of that pie. Now that pie is broken up often into millions of slices, but either way, as the pie grows, so does, so does your slice. And the way you have an opportunity to invest your money in a company is an entrepreneur has an idea, they get some money from a private equity or venture capital firm, uh, like in my industry, you start that business, you, and you start to build out your marketing plan, your sales plans, your operations plans, and then you grow that business to a certain size. And then ultimately that company does what we call go public in, an, in what we call an initial public offering. And so now that company becomes available for anyone to buy and not just those early investors. And a few examples, like I mentioned earlier, are Nike, um, Apple. Here, I have a couple of slides. Uh, if you Google any one of these companies and type the word stock next to it, you'll see one of these pages that gives you lots of information about how that particular company is doing. I won't spend a lot of time on the specific stock investing part of the presentation because I want to get to the, the mutual funds and perhaps some Q&A. But some of the key things to understand about a stock is 
is when you type that name, you see the name of the company here. You see the AAPL letters. That's what we call uh, the stock ticker for that company. It's the one to four letters that indicate that specific company that you can buy or sell. This number in black is the current share price. Now this is from um, March 25th of this year. So coronavirus had not quite uh, kicked in uh, as heavily. I'm looking on my phone right now because I'm gonna tell you guys what Apple stock price is today. So today, that if you had bought one share of Apple on March 25th at $245.52, that one piece of Apple, that one slice of pie that you bought for $245 would now be worth $438. Now, I could not predict that. Uh, we, you know, the, as we were watching television, you guys might've seen news about what was happening broadly in the economy with fears and concerns about how the coronavirus pandemic was going to affect the world and our nation. And that is the beauty of the economy and the markets. It is the symbiotic relationship between governments and countries, unemployment, housing, war, weather, uh, everything that's happening in our country comes to in potentially impact these companies as well as how these companies market and promote and compete. Uh, in, the free, in the free market capitalist society that we live in. So it's important that you guys as, as graduates going into your careers, you guys are gonna be earning uh, income as we talked about early on in the presentation. You're gonna be managing your budget. You're gonna save, you're gonna pay down debt. It's important though that you get involved in the investment side of the world. And it doesn't have to be through individual stocks. There are other ways to do it as well. And I'm gonna talk about that briefly here. So now let's talk about mutual funds. So my fav one of my favorite chips are Doritos Cool Ranch, um, made by Frito-Lay, actually. So Doritos Cool Ranch, like my favorite potato chip. So if I was grocery shopping, I could buy one of those huge bags of Doritos Cool Ranch, let that sit here, and every day for lunch, I know I'm having Doritos Cool Ranch. Another option would be to buy that variety pack of potato chips that gives you an, op an option to have plain chips, sour cream and onion, the, the, the Doritos that I like, albeit in smaller bite sizes. So the beauty of buying mutual funds it, is, is, is think of these chips now as different companies. So you now have exposure to a variety of companies that are all gonna do different things. Some are gonna go up, some are gonna go down. But with that one bag of Dorito, Doritos Cool Ranch, if I was tired of that chip one day, I'm stuck with it. Whereas with the variety of stock mutual funds, you have an opportunity to experience the gains and losses across a variety of companies, which helps to protect you from any one company doing really poorly in the portfolio. Um, I actually had an interesting question one day, uh, and hopefully this is not remedial for, for anyone, but I actually had someone, you know, working professional, asked, where do you go to buy stocks? And asked if you could go to the stores to buy them. And at the time, I thought it was a bit of a silly question. But again, if you've never been told about stocks and investing, it actually is not an unreasonable question to think, well, why can't I go to the Apple store and buy stock? Now, these are uh, securities that are managed and protected, rather, by the Security Exchange Commission, the SEC. It's a regulated industry. So that, in a sense, explains to you why it's not sold in the store. But you heard it here first. I envision a world, again, I like to think uh, wildly and creatively, is why not? Why couldn't we set up a system whereby if you're interested in buying stock in a company that you can't simply go to that store to do it? But today, that's not the world that we live in. And so where you go to buy stocks is what we call brokerage firms. Uh, and these are brick and mortar and online institutions that are licensed to help you buy and sell stock and other securities. These are accounts that work similar to bank accounts. You have to have a social security number, address, and you have to put money into them but then they facilitate the transfer of those assets from uh, me, uh, a seller of securities. So if I own some shares that I want to sell, they would handle making sure that you can buy it from me. And then they, they handle that process behind the scenes so that in your account, you would show shares that you purchased. And in my account, I would now have the cash that you used to buy it. Historically, you have some of these traditional uh, brokerages like Fidelity, Charles Schwab, and TD Ameritrade. They have brick and mortar. You can walk into an office and talk to someone. Again, post COVID, you'll be able to walk into an office and talk to someone, but they too all now have uh, online platforms. 
But what really started the online brokerage world is E-Trade. It's our first online uh, brokerage company, huge platform now. Uh, and there are others out there also. You can just log on and open an account. And then in the third category is what I call the next generation. Uh, I'll call those the next generation brokerage firms because they've taken a slightly different approach to investing. Everything from, I heard robo-advisors mentioned earlier, which I'll talk about in a second. There are companies that help you round up your spending and invest it for you. Uh, and then we also have a, a new feature called fractional shares, which give you the opportunity to buy pieces of a company that are even smaller than one share. Because one of the, in, inhibit, one of the inhibiting factors for getting into the stock market was that some of these companies had such high stock prices that many people couldn't even afford to buy one whole share. And so if you didn't have the ability to buy half a share or a quarter of a share or a tenth of a share, then you couldn't participate. And nowadays you can take $100 and invest in any company that you want, even Amazon, uh, which is priced really high right now, just in terms of the, do of the dollar value. So back to uh, robo-advisors, let's talk about that for a second. So I talked about the Doritos and the mutual funds and the bag of chips. Robo-advisors are, is like, is, is, is artificial intelligence, where you're telling this AI the type of investor that you are. You're giving it information about your age, your goals, your lifestyle, how you'd like to retire, when you'd like to retire, how much risk you're willing to take on. The same kind of conversation you would have with a human financial advisor, except in this case, the robo-advisor, you're putting this information in the computer, and it is automatically building a portfolio that it believes will suit your needs. Because there are some investments that fall in different categories. And I'll only talk about two for right now for the sake of time when it comes to stock, is they're what you call your blue chip companies. These are large, big companies whose stock prices tend not to, I'm gonna go back a few slides. So companies like a, sorry, an Apple, where over long periods of time, you may not see really huge jumps in its stock price. They tend to be larger, more stable companies, like my company where I used to work, Procter & Gamble, right? The company has been around since 18, in the 18, late 1800s. They sell consumer packaged goods. Generally speaking, people are always going to need those consumer packaged goods. So you don't expect something really wildly negative to happen to the company, but it's also not a tech it's not a, necessarily a super innovative company, even though they are coming out with new products. So you don't expect to see huge jumps in their portfolio the way you might or in their in their stock price, the way you see with some of the smaller, uh, newer companies that are, that are on the on the stock market. Again, none of that is meant to be construed as investment advice. I'm not here to play analyst. I'm giving general guidance and concepts about risk and the types of companies that you might invest. So now let's finish off with um, this quick discussion about 401k and 403b. So when you start a job, most companies, for-profit and non-profit, offer an investment vehicle called uh, 401k, and in the case of non-profits, it's called a 403b. And it's, it gives you an opportunity as an employee of that organization to invest your monies before it gets taxed into a select group of investments. And you have the option of what you want to choose in there. And most 401ks and 403bs offer an opportunity to invest in mutual funds. They tend not to have individual stock investment opportunities as part of their portfolio. So with your company, you would say, you know, company, I want to put away 5% of my salary into uh, pre-tax into stock. I'm sorry, into mutual funds and into my 401k. That means if you make, let me just use round numbers because it's easier. You make $100,000, you decide to put away 5,000 pre-tax. So that 5,000 of your 100 will come out, go into these investments in your 401k. And Uncle Sam, at least today, will only tax you on the 95. Now, the monies that have gone in as it grows over time will eventually get taxed later when you take it out, but it gets to grow over all that time without being taxed. And there are other uh, investment retirement vehicles that have different tax considerations that I won't go into fully on this call because again, I don't want to overwhelm or throw out too much information. But the 401k is often the, 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 the easiest, fastest way that as a new professional, you can begin to invest in, uh, in your future. 
And the most critical aspect of investing in a 401k is that, is that third piece on this slide. Many companies will offer a match to what you invest. Why is that important? So that 100,000 that I mentioned, where I'm in, I've decided I'm going to put 5% away into my 401k, the company might say, Rendell, we're willing to match you dollar for dollar up to 6%. So if I decide to put away 5%, that means my 5,000 will be there out of my 100, but the company will then put in another $5,000. And so you can put it in the chat, and I, my guess is there won't be many people saying this, but is there anybody in the chat or on this watching this webinar that if your company said, if you put up a dollar, we'll put another dollar next to it, would you not take that dollar? I don't see any reason not to take that dollar. And in fact, if you were listening carefully, I said that the company would match up to 6%. So if I only put away 5%, that means I've left 1% that I didn't invest, which would be another $1,000, which means that had I done that, had I, had I put away 6% of my own money, the company would have provided me $6,000 instead of five, another $6,000 instead of another $5,000. So by me not investing $1,000 in myself, it's still my money, I didn't go spend it, by not investing $1,000 in myself, the company did not invest another $1,000 in me as well. So it's important that when you start that job and you talk to your HR, specifically ask your company, do they offer a match with their 401k or 403b? And if they do, your goal should be to, at a minimum, put in enough money to get up to that match. And so as we wrap up, specifically on the investing piece, I think the three critical things to take away is that investing is, a, is about long-term. You can trade, and there are all kinds of programs you guys can go study and take to learn about trading. You can trade in those assets I mentioned earlier that I wasn't going to talk about. You can trade stocks. You can trade what we call options. There's all sorts of different ways to trade back and forth, hoping that you buy in low and sell high. But for long-term investing, a strategy that essentially says, build a good portfolio of assets and let it sit there over time. That's why I put time there first, because time is your best friend when it comes to long-term investing due to something called compound interest. It is your money making money on top of money. Early on, I said your money has three jobs when it leaves your house to sit and wait for you savings to go out and bring back goods and services like toilet paper and food, right? And cars. And the third piece is to go out and bring some more of its friends. And that's what we're talking about. Generally speaking, the longer you let your money hang out and go get more friends, the more consistently that they will bring friends back. So time, consistency, invest regularly. Try not to try to figure out, oh, should I invest this month, but not next month? I'll wait three more months. It doesn't feel good right now. Invest consistently. Figure out a dollar amount that makes sense. Your 401k is one of the most consistent ways that you can invest because you can just set aside a percentage and that automatically comes out every month. Consistency. And the diversification piece is to ensure that your money is spread across different things. That's all diversification means. So you want to invest in different types of assets from real estate to stocks and others. But even within stocks, you want to have diversification. And just like I showed you with the bag of the box of potato chips, Mutual funds offer a great opportunity to get some early diversification because the same stocks that you might purchase individually tend to be part of those mutual funds uh, as well. And, and, and each, all of those forms of investing have fees associated with it. So when you talk to an advisor, be sure to inquire about the fees specifically to purchase that security, okay? So as I wrap up, uh, please feel free to uh, follow me on Instagram. You can follow the nonprofit organization at One Stock, One Future to keep track of how I'm turning shareholders or turning young students into shareholders and follow my personal page at Rendell underscore Solomon. Uh, these are just a few sites that I like. I check out regularly from Mint.com related to budgeting to Investopedia and Fool.com, which will give you some key insights around uh, investing if you want to learn more there. And then my FICO.com will go into much more detail about how to manage your credit. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Ken and Jenna to see if there are any questions that I haven't answered or anything that I might be able to answer uh, on the call. 
Great. So, um, Wendell, we've got two questions that I'm going to ask you simultaneously because they're both about student loans. Oh, yeah, I just saw that one. Yeah, so the first is, should I pay off the loan ASAP mm -hmm. take as long as possible? And the question is based on the assumption that if you're paying, if the interest on the loan is less than 6%, mm -hmm. probably might get better gains um, for my money putting it uh, into investments. And then the second uh, question around student loans is, um, this individual actually, when she paid off her student loan, uh, her credit score went down. Should she be penalized? Uh, and is that because she now has fewer types of debt in her credit mix? So I don't know why, how you want to parse I will. No, I'll take, I'll take both. So actually, I'm scrolling down right now, and I see another one about um, paying off credit versus, uh, I'm sorry, paying off student loans versus uh, savings. So let me try to tackle the student loan question. Uh, in general. Great questions, by the way. Thank you for asking those uh, guys. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know how I got, I lucked into my interest rates. The loans that I still carry are at 2.25 and 2% right now. So even lower than the 6% that you, that you mentioned. And I, I still grapple with that same question. Every dollar that I use to pay off that loan, I say to myself, man, I'm pretty certain I could have done better than that 2% that I'm paying off by putting it into an investment vehicle. With that said, without fully understanding your full financial picture, it's still a tricky question to answer, but let me try to give you some guidance and some things to think about. Would I, would I rush to pay off that loan instead of investing? The short answer is probably no. You still should be paying the minimums for sure. Now, you don't wanna run into any default or mispayment situation with your student loans. But I will say this, um, I think that depending on your goals for other things, so for me, where I am in life right now, uh, as I think about uh, real estate purchase and uh, other, other um, things that I want to accomplish in the next five years, uh, I've gotten my, I've probably had a, about $150,000 of school loans at one point between my undergrad and my, um, and my grad school loans. So I'm now, I'm now down under 50,000. So it's taking me a while. I had to take a detour. As I mentioned, as an entrepreneur, I didn't get into some of the stories that I was going to share. I'm happy to do so now. Some of them are actually pretty funny. But for, from, uh, I didn't really pay off anything on my grad school loans. From I graduated in 05, it wasn't until probably 2012, 13, that I could really get back to making any meaningful payments. On, on those loans. So I think it becomes about where are you in life? What are you trying to get accomplished? How much student loans that you carry? Because as you think about other loans that you may take on before you get the student loans paid off from mortgage and others, then that overall loan number gets bigger. And then there, there's a calculation of how much you make versus how much total you have out in loans. So to the extent that you can get that student loan number lower as you seek to take on other potential loans, I think that becomes the calculus and not just the whether or not you can earn a better rate of return. And we can always hold out hope that at some point our, our federal government decides to wipe away everyone's, everyone's loans. But I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. I'd love to see that, that bill that just passed wiping away 10,000 in private loans come through. But again, I, I'm not holding my breath and I'm steadily paying down on my loans. But for me, even though the interest rate is so low on my student loans, it is going to be a powerful emotional moment when every student loan uh, is paid off. And I expect that to happen sometime in 2021 uh, for me. As it relates to the score going down, this goes back to the, the, rhyme, the lack of rhyme or reason as it relates to uh, credit scoring. So definitely check out myfico.com and type in that question. I don't have a perfect answer for the score going down when you pay it off, other than exactly, I think, as you astutely pointed out, this machine is actually looking to see that you have other forms of credit. So if you pay one off, now that's gone. Sadly, there's part of the algorithm that even though the amount of credit and debt that you have has gone down, it now sees one less account on your, uh, in your portfolio. And so it does weird things to the, uh, to the score. Or there could be something else going on that you didn't see. I don't know that for sure, but that is, an, that is another option. Hopefully that helps. Somewhat. There's one other one I was going to answer too, Ken, I can see here. How do you know which brokerage firm to 
to choose from. Great question there. Uh, there's a site, um, I forget where it is. If you Google, you know, what are the best um, um, brokerage apps or the best stock apps, for example, it'll offer some insights into which ones are the best. But I will say this, that is a very relative um, uh, aspect of choosing a brokerage firm. So let me give you my thoughts about which one to choose. There are, uh, again, fees associated with making trades. So the, they, the brokerage firms differ in the amount that they charge you to move your money from your cash and to buy a stock. Some are higher, some are lower. They used to be as high as seven, $8 per trade. With the newer online platforms, those numbers have come down to $2.99 in some cases. And so the older uh, brokerage firms have realized they can't now, they now they can't charge $8 when you can go do the exact same thing for 99 cents. That's one. The security piece is interesting. They're all backed by the, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. There's, there is protection for your money, no matter which brokerage firm that you use. So if there's fear of that, 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 that firm may go out of business, you're protected if you see that FD up to a certain amount when you see that FDIC logo on that page. So there's no real advantage there. Uh, another advantage, the larger brokerage firms, the older ones like Fidelity, Charles Schwab, Edward Jones, you can call them and they can also serve as your advisor. You can call and get feedback and guidance about your specific uh, investment questions and considerations. Some of the newer platforms like an Acorns or a Stash, I haven't used them personally, but that's not their focus. Their focus is not set up to offer you individualized investment advice when you call them. They offer an online platform that gives you the ability to trade at smaller amounts and to make it more fun and more interesting and engaging. And that leads to the last difference amongst brokerage firms, user interface. When you go to acorns.com right now or Robinhood right now, their website is, looks very different than going to fidelity.com. So I can't say which one is best or worse, but for you, the listener, for Ken on the screen and for me on the screen, we may have different features that we like. We may have a favorite color and I know that may sound silly, but it really does boil down to that. This entity is now managing your money. You have to look at it on some regular basis. Do you, do you want to look at something that's visually appealing to you, that's talking in language and colors and, 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 and charts and graphs that are a bit easier to understand? Or, or are you very technical and want some in-depth research and insights about the marketplace? So as you dive deeper into the investment world, you actually may decide to switch brokerages later. So the fees, the ability to connect with human beings to get some specific investment advice and the user interface, I think are the three key items that differentiate the brokerage firms. Um, Rendell, uh, on that same uh, question, mm -hmm. many firms that match, companies that match what you contribute, do they offer uh, the, comp the uh, investment companies they work with do they offer uh, any investment advice uh, from time to time? You, are you saying do the companies offer it, yeah. Ken? Yeah, that's for a, instance, that's a, that's I know that question. Columbia, TIA, mm -hmm. and Vanguard, they have representatives that will meet with individuals. And uh, so if you don't have a private wealth manager, mm -hmm. that those companies will, uh, that you're investing with will offer those services. You know, that's, a, that's another great question. I think that uh, that has been one of the, the biggest criticisms of the 401k plan, which has been around for decades, is that, uh, again, I'm 21, 20, 20, I was 20 years old when I graduated. I show up at Procter & Gamble. Uh, so here's a quick side story, by the way, on the budgeting piece and why that's so critical. And then I'll answer your question about uh, lessons on 401k. Uh, I got a job making $53,000 a year. I'm 21 years old. Um, never thought of having that much money. I'm the first one to graduate college in my family and I got an advance of essentially one month. So I got $5,000 up front, uh, a little less than $5,000 up front. And I basically used all of that to pay my first month rent, my security deposit, and I bought a car. So I drive down to Cincinnati from Chicago to start work at Procter & Gamble. I have an apartment. Uh, there are two critical things, Ken, that I don't have yet. What is that? I have no furniture, 
and I have no food in the refrigerator and I'm not getting paid for about another month. And so I ended up having to borrow uh, $3,000 from my current boss mentor at the time, right? He's been in my life for a long time. And when I called him to borrow that money, he asked me how much I needed. I said about 3000 but he only sent me 2200 And I was confused, but then he, re he recalled that I had crashed his car a few years prior and the repairs cost $800, which he paid for. So he sent me 2200 but gave me a promissory note, a loan at 7.5% interest for $3,000. So that's just a quick little lesson on budgeting, expenses, and debt and paying it off and managing your credit all in one experience that I had with my mentor. Uh, but as it relates to lessons at the job, uh, I'm not sure a lot of all of them do. I mean, they're the financial advisor that they use to manage their 401k program. If you call them, they can offer you some insight. But what I'm not sure companies are doing now, and I would be a huge advocate of that around the country, is that part of your onboarding at a company should be sitting down with someone to have that conversation to encourage that, uh, um, that you shouldn't have to ask, dear company, do you match? As part of your onboarding should be, we match, you need to do this. <laughs> because I can't think of any good reason not to invest up to the match if the company is offering it. Even if for whatever reason, you don't believe in the 401k and you want to invest post-tax money and let it grow versus investing pre-tax money and paying taxes later, that's that's all well and good. You can have great discussions about that. But if somebody is offering you $1,000, if you can come up with $1,000, I truly encourage you to come up with $1,000. That is a 100% return on your money uh, every time you put some away. And so, so again, can't speak for every company, but for the listeners on this call, your first job, second job, whatever it is in your career with undergrad or gradu graduates uh, from Columbia, please talk to your companies about their 401k, 403bs, and their retirement plan. And Wendell, um, somebody who uh, has a 401k is asking, can they withdraw uh, monies from their 401 or the 403b uh, in an emergency? And are there penalties attached? To yes, uh, you can. There are penalties. I highly, 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 highly discourage uh, doing so. But... I understand that stuff happens. I could say stronger language, but this is being recorded and I respect Columbia, but stuff does happen. And if the situation is so dire that that is truly your only option, and I'm talking about potentially being without a home or potentially going without food for your kid type emergency situation, right? But if you're doing all the other things, in theory, it won't get there. But if you find yourself in such a dire emergency that you have literally no other option, then the answer is yes. And that you can actually borrow from your 401k without necessarily withdrawing it. And when you borrow from it, you actually, you pay it back. So I don't believe, again, talk to your company and an advisor. I don't believe you get hit with the penalty, but you pay yourself back with interest. So that's the positive news. If you borrow $10,000 from your 401k, you pay yourself back at 5%. So you actually end up paying yourself back more. But here's the problem. Two big things are happening there. To pay it back, you're paying it back with post-tax dollars, which in and of itself is a problem. And then two, you have missed out. Remember the time piece of the uh, long-term investing equation? If you pull out the $10,000 to buy whatever it is you need to get through that emergency, that $10,000 is, $10, is now not working for you in the market the way it would have over what time, whatever time period it takes you to pay it back. I think they usually give you up to five years to pay it back. So let's say you take the whole five years, that's five years worth of market returns and compounding on that 10,000 that you would miss. And there are ways you can um, do calculations uh, in a simulated way to see how will borrowing $10,000 from your 401k impact the long-term trajectory of your portfolio. So I highly discourage uh, taking money out of your 401k early, but I understand that there are emergency situations. It looks like we've hit. I think we got. I think we got them. Set, yeah. So, uh, and we we're going to give everybody about 90 seconds of their day back, including you. Um, but Rendell, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking us through this. And it was I was listening to you. I was saying, where was something like this? Mm. graduated college. 
uh, where was something like this when I graduated graduate school? Um, so uh, I feel like you have offered some, some real thoughtful advice today to help people um, hopefully start in a better place than you and I did. Absolutely, Ken. It, was, it truly was my pleasure. I love talking about these things. And just like I did with One Stock, One Future, um, I try to stay as high level as possible because any one of these areas, guys, and I'm actually working on a course right now, any one of these areas could involve, I mean, there's so much information that I didn't share. I actually see a question now in the chat that didn't make it to the Q&A about paying off a credit card every month versus little by little. Yeah. I could have a whole other lesson about credit cards and how to affect each area of raising your score and how to manage credit and how to get credit cards paid off using various, various methods. And I'd love to chat about that more. Again, definitely follow me on Instagram at Rendell uh, underscore Solomon. Feel free to shoot me a direct message uh, there. Feel free, if you took any screenshots of this presentation, feel free to, to, to put it up somewhere and, and, and tag me with some hopefully positive reviews. If it's negative, send me those directly first and then we can, we can chat about it after afterwards. But it's been a pleasure. I look forward to having more dialogue uh, with you guys and with you, Ken. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Doreen, for, for organizing this. And congratulations once again to the class of 2020 uh, all across Columbia. That's right. Congratulations and stay safe and healthy. Wendell, again, thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.